Um, the first speaker is talking about the International Aortic Arch uh, Project. It's Professor Yan, who's not from Liverpool, but, but actually from Sydney, Australia. Professor Yan. Good afternoon. Um, thanks for the introduction. The, the talk is entitled The Arch Project. Uh, the project's been going on for the last two years. It recently were kept in a very low profile. This is a talk basically trying to introduce some demographic data of the ARCH project and where we are at with this international collaborative effort. Um, we had an intentional primary objective that is look at the trying to work out what is the most effective, uh, the best neuroprotective strategies for patient ongoing aortic arch surgery. So be it uh, hemi, hemi arch or circulatory a rest time less than 30 minutes or total arch patients. Okay? So looking at different uh, cerebral protection methods, deep hypothermia, deep hypothermia with selective anti-grade, deep hypothermia with um, retrograde, uh, or more recently with moderate hypothermia plus selective anti-grade cerebral perfusion. Because by, by, by now, we still haven't worked out which one offers more neural protection. Okay? There hasn't been convincing evidence um, demonstrating um, this to on this topic. We also have other uh, secondary objectives, looking at the perioperative morbidity mortality, operative risks, long-term survival outcomes, and uh, also subgroup comparative analyses, looking at unilateral versus bilateral, um, deep hypothermia versus moderate hypothermia, dissection cases, um, acute versus chronic, Etc. We had a research plan. Uh, we're still following this path. We initially reviewed all the existing literature, uh, went back to the last 30 years on arch surgery, and uh, we established a consensus statement. And also, we um, have completed data collection process for retrospective database. And uh, with that, project, after that project has been completed, we're going to move on to prospective aspects. Evaluation of current literature, we went back to the last 30 years and found out all the publication related to every arch surgery, identified 1,300 um, 1, um, publications, extrapolated important information out of all this literature, and uh, um, uh, performed quite a few multi multivariate analysis and systematic reviews on the topic. What we did find is that there are heterogeneous definitions of clinical variables, um, very low patient numbers of um, various different techniques, insufficient reporting of post op outcomes, and confounding factors um, that are intrinsic for retrospective studies. There was a lack of standardized term terminology we use for uh, hypothermia. Deep hypothermia at one center doesn't mean the same of deep hypothermia at another center. So therefore, a consensus was required, and we did that about two years ago, based on some human studies looking at uh, the electrocerebral silence uh, at various temperatures. The consensus. Um, stated that profound hypothermia is less than 14 degrees, deep hypothermia is 14 to 20 degrees, moderate hypothermia is 20 to 28, and mild hypothermia is 28 plus. So with this definition, uh, we'll be able to compare the results um, of institutions, among the institutions. So how did we plan to address the low patient number situation in inadequate, inadequately powered studies? Most studies were talking about hundreds of patients at most, you know, uh, 400, 500 cases for arch patients. So therefore, uh, it was quite logical to, uh, to aggregate or to, to bring all the centers together uh, to form a multi-institutional uh, database. Um, that requires institution review, review board approval from uh, individual centers. We're talking about patients with hemi arches, total arches, and hyper arch cases. Um, we required consecutive patients, not just cherry pick the important or best ones. And the patient did de de-identified, and uh, we asked the surgeons to 
to provide information related to patient indication, uh, surgical techniques and outcomes. The study design and rationale is published in the European Journal. Today, uh, until today, we have 30, 37 centres okay, around the world uh, from 12 different countries contributed to this, um, the ARCH database. Overall, we have 13,500 patients in, in the database. So it is a major um, effort um, and uh, all the information, we basically have <coughs> 1.3 million data cells uh, in our uh, database and uh, we tried we have been going to and have been keep on working on this database for the last year. Uh, two research fellows working on this, and uh, and the database is now completed. We are uh, validating the database for the third time, and before we uh, we call for questions, and um, uh, and then we can start analyzing this database. There's a wealth of information can come out of this database, and I can assure you it's going to be one of the most very important, or if not the most important, um, research projects can come up in the next few years. Just to give you some ideas in terms of the overall demographics. So overall we have uh, 13,400 patients from 37 centres, a mean age of 61. Um, this is a, a distribution of patients' age. And we can see there is increased use of moderate hypothermia and um, uh, over time, since 2000 and until 2012. And also there is a trend of increased moderate hypothermia with selected antigrace cerebral fusion. It is trendy, but is the right thing to do. Um, there are some surprises from the database, which I'm not going to disclose at this stage, um, but the results are very stimulating and um, can be quite controversial. From this database, we'll be able to analyze, we, we can look at the indication of a surgeon, we can look at the aneurysm patients, about 7,000 patients had aneurysm disease, 6,000 patients had acute aortic syndrome, and uh, we had quite a large number of patients under each, for each category. And we can work out what is the optimal neural protection strategy for patients having aneurysm disease or <coughs> acute aortic syndrome, for hemi arches, total arches, respectively, and utilizing deep hypothermia alone, <coughs> deep hypothermia with select antigrade or retrograde cerebral fusion. We also can work out um, cannulation strategies for emergent cases, urgent cases, and elective cases whether central cannulation, peripheral antigrade cannulation, or retrograde cannulation. We can compare unilateral versus bilateral perfusion, both for hemiarches and total arches, using various cannulation strategies, and compare frozen elephant trunk versus <coughs> elephant trunk <coughs> procedures. We've got quite a large number of patients in each category. We can compare branch technique versus island technique and looking at various post-operative <coughs> complications, mortality, permanent neurological um, deficit, temporary neurological deficit, spinal cord injury, which hadn't been studied very well for arch surgery, acute kidney injury and dialysis patients. We can look at hospital stay, ICU stay, and more importantly, it has almost 8,000 patients of long-term outcomes uh, in the database. We can look at the temperature effect on the long-term outcome of patients undergoing arch surgery. Many, many different options we can, uh, we can um, study through this database. So after we aggregated all the, you know, collected all the data from different centers, all we found was that it has been an inconsistent reporting of post-operative outcomes. Most centers report very well at their uh, death and stroke. A little information on cardiac complications 
uh, inconsistent reporting of respiratory, renal, visual organ dysfunction, and spinal cord injury. So therefore, it's important for us at that stage, about a year ago, um, to come up with a um, classification or guideline, standardized um, uh, classification for reporting post-operative outcomes after our surgery. <coughs> So we went back to the old literature, identified this article, published in Annals of Surgery. This article has been cited more than 3,000 times. Um, basically, they classified surgical complications in general surgical literature, surgical complications according to um, different grades. So we changed a little. Um, that is, now it's going to be specific for aortic arch surgery, grade grade one complications, any deviation from normal course, mm -hmm. self-limiting, does not require any uh, therapeutic interventions, or maybe just uh, simple therapeutic interventions such as IV fluids, uh, antiemetics, analgesia, stuff like that. Grade two complications are the ones requiring pharmacological treatment, atrial fibrillation requiring beta blocker. Grade three complications are those requiring surgical or interventional procedures not going back to theatre, not in ICU. Uh, for example, pleurifusion requiring CT guided drainage. Grade four complications those um, that require surgical intervention, back to theatre, general anesthetic, prolonged ICU stay, prolonged hospital stay. And grade five are the uh, complications causing death. So with, the, with this classification, we applied to each individual um, organ system. So we graded um, the uh, complications for neurological system, cardiovascular system, respiratory system, um, renal system, gastrointestinal system, and some surgical parameters not included on this slide. So with this grading system, we send it to all the aortic surgeons, 51 aortic surgeons, uh, aortic centers around the world. Uh, 45 surgeons from 40 institutions responded. And we asked them whether they thought the way we classified the, uh, the perioperative outcomes for aortic surgery, um, whether we're, they are happy with that or whether they have any um, uh, constructive uh, suggestions to improve it. 98 or 96 to 98 percent of the surgeons agreed with the way we classified the grading system for uh, perioperative outcomes for uh, neurological, cardiovascular, respiratory, renal, gastrointestinal, surgical parameters. Most people think it's reproducible, logical, useful, and comprehensive. Some people did not think it was comprehensive enough but we're talking about 22 uh, clinical endpoints, four grades for each. It's quite a lot. So that article is published in circulation uh, very recently without any revision. It is our hope after we completed the retrospective uh, database, um, use that information or data derived from the retrospective database <coughs> And generate more hypotheses and answer some of the questions. But it may well be there are a lot of questions that cannot be answered with retrospective database. But hopefully, we can move on to the next phase, which is the prospective uh, trials. So, International Aortic Arch Surgery Study Group, established in the last two years now, uh, the main aim is to standardize the reporting formats to facilitate multi institutional studies to determine the best neurological uh, protective strategies, and also to establish the benchmarks for aortic surgery. Thanks for your time. Thank you very much indeed. It's a, a, an excellent enterprise. When, when do you expect to publish data from this? Um, I think it's not far from that. Uh, probably uh, before end of the year, um, and I'm sure there are going to be a string of publications coming out of this database. At the moment, we, we finished the data collection about six, six months ago. Okay? And we're validating the data a third time uh, just to make sure um, uh, there are no mistakes in, during the collect, uh, data collection phase and, and make sure the aggregation 
uh, the process is done properly, um, the coding is done properly, and uh, very soon, I would say, we'll be able to uh, generate the complete version of this uh, 13,500 patients. And then we're going to give the opportunity to all participating centres um, to, um, to uh, put their hands up and uh, publish out of the database. Right. Do we have any questions from, uh, from the floor? W will it be possible for an individual centre to ask a question and get the answer from the database. So rather than you running it all, that, that, that it's actually a facility for, for each of the, uh, uh, the, the units that are, are putting the data in. Yeah. Just want to correct you on that point. Uh, my role is to bring all the centres together so that we have opportunity and platform for the database to be generated. And we have a steering committee consists of uh, 17 uh, aortic surgeons out of these 37 centres and all the research question has to be, uh, be passed through the steering committee uh, and the collaborative research group based in Sydney, Australia will facilitate the whole process, will analyse the results and uh, maintain the integrity of the database. Um, yes, there will be plenty of opportunities for people to ask the questions and then as long as they have been approved by the steering committee and they will be analysed and uh, will be published. Should we, we should be able to see the, our own data from that. Yeah. Uh, for, for the kind of question regarding the whole group data, yeah. then so I'll have to go through the kind of uh, series. So for, for all the centres you can see their own data, um, and, but you cannot identify other centres' data. You can compare your own data with the rest of the group. Um, yeah. It is not meant to be a comparison between centre versus another centre. It's meant to be, uh, um, you know, all the centres and de-identified, patient de-identified. It's mainly looking at uh, uh, cerebral protection strategies and the pair of the outcomes as a whole. Yeah. Tristan, question. Um, it's fa fantastic that uh, this has taken off and, and, and that we have this uh, database, um, but it has collected data retrospectively. How far are we from having a data collection prospectively? That's a very good question. We have been uh, simultaneously working on the prospective uh, arm for the last year. Uh, the website is being built. Uh, where we're stuck at the moment is the, uh, the coding for all the descriptors. Uh, we have up, you know, done about 40 pages of coding for the descriptors. It's a huge project. Um, we want to do it uh, and to do it in the correct way. Uh, so we're proceeding that aspect very cautiously. Uh, I would say for the next six months, we'll be able to have the website up and running with all the uh, prospective data fields uh, approved by the steering committee and uh, available online. Um, so the centres can contribute data prospectively, which I think is more important, uh, despite the size of the retrospective database. Yeah, yeah. And I, th I think it's more promising to have an ongoing prospective collected database for uh, patients undergoing arch surgery. Thanks. How, how did you get the whole project funded? Because usually, I mean, that's something, um, it's not so easy to get funding for these kind of uh, more independent projects. And also, it's not really easy to have centres buying into the extra work of uh, feeding the database in a poor way without having any kind of research <coughs> agreements in place. So how is it funded? Yes, yeah, so in the past I certainly think that's the case. But uh, there has been a, a high level of trust among all the centres. I think that's more important. Okay, everyone wants to collaborate on this project. So there's this true sense of collaboration and sharing the information and generate something that uh, to answer the question cannot be answered in the past. I think that's the main initiative. The funding of the project is partially funded by my research group, which is a collaborative research group based in Sydney. It's a university based, and um, um, the amount of funding is not going to be disclosed here, but uh, it's, yeah. it's a lot of initiative from all the centres and uh, um, university funding. Okay, we did try to apply for a national grant, NHMRC, 
that fell through because the nature of the project. Teresa, thank you very much. You're welcome. Thanks.